to episode 12 of the Data Driven Strength Podcast. Today, Zach and I are going to be chatting about individualization. Um, we're going to be framing today's discussion around three things that Zach and I came up with that we've kind of learned oftentimes the hard way um, in terms of individualizing training for our athletes. Um, throughout this discussion, we're going to be um, integrating some 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 talk about our new individualized programming plus self-coaching toolkit product. However, even if you're not interested in this product, that's absolutely fine. Um, at the end of the podcast, we're, we're even going to talk about who it's for and who it's not for. Um, so we're going to be very clear about that. So even if you're not interested in this product, um, hopefully, and, and we've set this podcast up so that it's, it's still going to be valuable for you. Um, so yeah, with, with that out of the way, Zach, do you want to go ahead and kind of frame the, the issue in the community and the, the, the gap we're trying to fill and the gap that we noticed? Yeah. So, uh, kind of the more experience we've gotten with one-on-one -on -one coaching, I think, um, we've progressively realized that it's an inherently limited endeavor. Um, and that's not to say it's bad. It's just the fact that, um, to give every client, um, the appropriate attention that they need one-on-one -on -one coaching rosters are obviously limited, um, just, just by that fact alone. Um, and then you add in the fact that one-on-one -on -one coaching is pretty expensive. The pool of lifters that are, that are served by one-on-one -on -one coaching is going to be, you know, pretty small in comparison to how many lifters are in the community at large. Then you kind of uh, add in the fact that this is going to leave a bunch of lifters looking for, you know, either really, really cheap or even free options online. Often these training programs are just going to be, you know, built for the masses and just in just general, which, you know, is, is why they're free. But that's going to leave a ton of lifters not having really solid training that is individualized for them and often is going to lead to them spinning their wheels in terms of progression. Um, so when we kind of like were reflecting on this, we wanted to make a product that was going to be really cost effective, but also was able to deliver a pretty individualized option for these tons of lifters that are left unserved by the limitations of one-on-one -on -one coaching um, due both to the, to the inherently limited nature of it based on roster sizes, and then also the fact that it's pretty expensive. Uh, so we just wanted to put another option on the table that was going to give a, the lifters the vast majority of benefits of one-on-one of, of -on -one coaching, particularly the individualization process of the training, and then also giving them the kind of the tagline, the self-coaching toolkit over time to continue to refine things and, and learn how to make adjustments in their own training to even develop that further uh, over the course of the long term. Yeah, so I think I would probably say that two different types of people could benefit from this. And again, we'll, we'll talk more about this at the end of the podcast, but whether you want to, you know, you just want really good programming, that's going to improve for you cycle over cycle. Um, you know, this, this is going to be excellent. If you don't want to think a ton about it, you just want good training. That's absolutely fine. But also if you want to dive into the nitty gritty, um, you know, watch the, the, the monthly webinars as well as chat in the private Facebook group that you'll get, um, while on this, on this product. Um, and you know, we're going to give you the tools to adjust the nitty gritty. Um, you know, you can do that as well. So no matter which side of the fence you fall on in that regard, it's totally fine. Um, I just kind of wanted to, to add that right now. Um, and before we move on to the, the, the three things we want to talk about today, I, I like to conceptualize what we've created as a productized version of our individualization process that we've fallen on while working one on one with athletes. So, you know, when 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 we have an athlete where we've really gravitated towards making cycle to cycle changes nice and systematic and kind of using the 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 scientific process within the individual to really tease out what's working best for them and helping them hone in on, you know, the proper uh, training formula for them that's going to lead to reliable, repeatable and and robust progress over time. Um, so that's kind of just like from a high level, what we've done. And we've basically, we've done that by creating a, a training cycle uh, or a library of 500 different training cycles with all the different, you know, combinations and configurations of the, the training variables that we think are the most important to individualize over time. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second here. Um, and we've created a system to, um, you know, kind of adjust those configurations and those combinations over time. Um, okay, before we get into those those three things I talked about, um, I just wanted to give a quick disclaimer that we're going to largely focus on strength in this podcast and frame this discussion around strength. Um, but if you are only interested in hypertrophy, um, you will also have the option of selecting hypertrophy as your goal. So, you know, there's an initial individualization quiz and you'll be able to ask 
uh, you'll, you'll be able to indicate whether your goal is only powerlifting, your goal is strength and size, or if your goal is just muscle growth. So I just wanted to, to add that in there for any listener that, um, you know, uh, that might be relevant too. All right, Zach, do you want to throw out the, the first thing we've, we've learned the hard way? <laughs> yeah, I, I think this is probably the main thing that we've kind of come around to pretty recently um, is, is just conceptualizing um, the variables that need to be individualized um, as, as some kind of being necessary for progress. And I, th I think the, the one that we keep coming back to that we kind of think is the, the most important thing to individualize first with an, with an athlete is this concept we've been calling the total training dose. So at kind of the first time you hear that, you might think that's, you know, um, synonymous with training volume. Um, it's going to be really, really closely tied to training volume, but it's not that in isolation. Total training dose is this kind of just this overall um, variable for, for total training stress, I think is probably the best kind of analogy you can draw with that. So things like uh, proximity to failure, the load on the bar, exercise selection, all of these things we think also play into this concept called total training dose. And then of course, uh, training volume does as well. So it's just this kind of overall metric of training stress that we think, and essentially the way that we define it, once that is in a proper uh, range, progress is, is it can occur. And, and then from there, we can take that training dose. And because I mentioned all those variables that can kind of go into that, we can configure those in different ways to lead to the same total dose, but that can result in different rates of progress for that athlete, depending on how they respond to different things. So, you know, a, a, just a very basic example of that could be, you know, Josh may respond to, again, this is a variable that we can't quantify. So I want to be that very, very clear about that, but I'm going to use some numbers just to like kind of give a example is let's say Josh responds to, or, or seems to make progress with 50 units of total training dose. That could be a high volume, far proximity to failure program on a lot of hypertrophy movements, or maybe we switch those variables around a little bit. It's a lower volume, really close to failure, maybe on more competition lifts that equals the same dose and they could both relate to progress. And maybe one of those two configurations leads to a faster rate of gain for Josh, but maybe on the opposite. So just the concept being there, there seems to be this total training stress that each individual uniquely has um, kind of a, kind of a level that they uh, will make progress with. And then from there, the long-term individualization from that is just finding configurations of that dose that are going to allow for the most progress over time. So, you know, kind of bringing this back towards the product, that's one of the main things we want to, to try to nail down for people is, is based on this initial individualization quiz, we're trying to hone in on a training dose that is going to allow uh, an athlete to progress. And then from there, we'll make some small modifications to some other variables, such as uh, like their peak intensity or top set protocols, the volume allocation between competition lifts and, and hypertrophy variants, and then maybe even the average intensity um, of your back off volume and stuff like that. We find those things are secondary to finding just this overall training dose that allows you to make progress. And then also the other thing to consider there is that that's not necessarily a global thing. We kind of consider it on a per lift basis. And now obviously there's going to be some overlap between the squat and the deadlift there, but we kind of view it as a, as a per lift um, phenomenon. And then we kind of go from there to again, individualize things um, over the long term. but that's kind of the, the, the main variable we think is, is the first priority um, to kind of make sure it's in the right spot before we kind of go any, anywhere else. Josh, go ahead, clean up anything I missed there. No, I think that's really good. I think um, the, the way that I like to, to frame it, which I think you did a good job of, is if, to, if the total training dose for a given lift, let's say you know the, 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 the training stress you're applying for your squat if it's not within a range that allows you to make progress, there's, there's no, there's nothing else you can do. Worrying about exercise selection, worrying about the nitty gritty is not going to be of use un until you get into a zone of total training dose. Again, like Zach said, for each squat bench and deadlift that allows you to progress. Some people will be on one end of the spectrum. Some people will be on the other end of the spectrum. A lot of people will be in the middle. But I think, you know, when working one-on-one -on -one with clients, I think the, the most potent thing you can do when troubleshooting a, a lack of response or a, a rate of response that is not satisfactory is using some subjective input and either bumping that up a little bit, dropping it down a little bit. Of course, we want to kind of 
you know, make those adjustments in a smart way. We don't want to double somebody's training volume overnight. Um, and we also don't want to cut it in half overnight, but having a system to dial that in over time, I think is probably the, the most important thing. And I, I think this is where we see a lot of people go wrong is, you know, uh, my four sets of five on Wednesday's uh, squat session, you know, I'm doing those, uh, I'm doing those two count pause squats and changing them to pins next block is, is really going to make or break my training. It's like, yes, there might be a time and a place to adjust your exercise selection. Absolutely. But, but that's kind of the, the tip of the pyramid, really what's at the base of the pyramid is, okay, what is the total training dose for this lift? And then from there, we can think about what's the configuration of that training dose. So this, these are things like top set protocols, volume allocation, average intensity. Um, and also, you know, using objective rate of rates of progress that we've built into, uh, you know, kind of this product. So basically what it'll do is it'll, it'll know your, um, it'll know your strength level and kind of categorize you into like a beginner intermediate or advanced for each of your lifts. And what we've done is we've looked at some of the rates of, of strength gain in the, the literature, as well as looked back at, um, some old client data or current client data, but, you know, training that's occurred in the past. And we've kind of said, okay, what would put an individual in the green in terms of a rate of progress that we think is satisfactory? What would put them in the red? Okay. You either didn't make progress. Um, maybe you've even, even regressed a little bit or your progress was, was not even detectable. So that would be in the red. And then there's also the yellow zone. So what we've allowed lifters to do is, okay, we, we give you this red, yellow, green stoplight system for your rate of strength gain. And if it's green, it's like, Hey, this is a good sign. Things are working. We should probably run a similar formula for your squat next cycle. If things are in the yellow, that's where your subjective input comes in. How did you generally feel about things, right? The, the numbers are very helpful, right? Of, uh, of course they are, but we, there are inherent limitations to, to, blindly following the numbers. So we did, we wanted to leave a little bit of room there for the lifters own interpretation, um, of how the training cycle went. So again, I think that's really the, the biggest thing in the hallmark feature. I think we're going to talk about some other things as well, but I think is dialing that in for each squat bench and deadlift is really what allows you to proceed to worrying about the nitty gritty, which is where I think a lot of people go wrong. So Zach, unless you have anything to add, I can jump to number two. Awesome. So number two is that constraints are necessary to individualize within or in order to individualize training for somebody, having constraints that you individualize within is going to be unavoidable. So what this means is if we just take a step back and we think about what are all the different training variables that go into somebody's training? What, what goes into the, the training program itself. Of course, we have the obvious answers. We have volume, we have intensity, we have frequency. Um, but there's also more nitty gritty variables, right? There is how many intro weeks are there for this individual? How many deloads are there for this individual? At what frequency do those occur? Um, to what degree are the deloads reduced training stress compared to previous, um, to, to you know the, the weeks at your peak workload? Um, how long is your strength phase? Um, you know, we often talk about uh, in the, the block preceding a, a test or a meet using a lot of low fatigue training strategies. You know, to what degree do we lean into those low fatigue training strategies? To what degree do we use them far out from competition, et cetera? So point being is there are infinite, there are tons and tons of, of training variables that you can uh, individualize, of course. But what we've kind of conceptualized over time, and again, we've learned this the hard way working one-on-one -on -one with athletes, is that you can really get lost in the weeds and, and, and you can really start to miss the forest for the trees by starting to, to worry about the nitty gritty. Now, don't get me wrong. There are definitely a, a time and a place to adjust certain things beyond you know, just the, the total training dose and the configuration of that total training dose. Um, and we're going to talk about this later. Uh, we've We've... We're going to be providing educational resources as well as discussion um, in a private Facebook group to address some of that stuff and to kind of rectify this limitation. But point being is we have to set constraints to individualize within, because if we get, if we start to consider every single possible 
lit nitty gritty training variable, it becomes very hard to detect signal from the noise in terms of analyzing your training response. So what we've chosen to do is, is say, okay, what makes sense to do proactively and what makes sense to do reactively? So things, uh, a couple proactive things we've decided to do is the periodization of the training cycle, right? So if your goal is strength, uh, you, you know, we kind of have a proactive periodization model in which the, the, the first half of the training cycle is going to be more of a hypertrophy emphasis. And the second half of the training cycle is going to be more of a strength emphasis. And in that strength emphasis, uh, training block the you know, the back half of the, the training cycle, that is going to utilize, utilize a lot of the low fatigue training uh, strategies that we often talk about. And again, those can be individualized and that, that, that stuff we might cover in the private Facebook group as well as the monthly webinars. But we think it makes sense to let's leave those as proactive because based on the current state of the literature and you know our experience, those aren't really the big hitters in terms of individualization. So let's set some constraints so that we can actually have some so we can actually detect some signal from the noise. Um, so that's how I like to frame, you know, the the unavoidable constraints for individualization. Zach, I don't know if if you want to add anything there. Yeah, not too much. I mean, it, I just think it's it's worth hitting home again the fact that if, if you open yourself to every single possibility of individualization, it, it, it essentially you have so many possibilities that you end up not moving forward at all, and you don't actually end up making any progress towards this you know, theoretically optimal training program for an individual. Um, by setting some constraints, you are having a regular testing interval and in, in which in which you can, can kind of compare apples to apples. If, if we set the same training cycle after 12 weeks, we're going to assess and then make small changes over time. It's much more like the scientific method in kind of making those small changes over time um, and, and evaluating the response. But if we're just kind of opening ourselves up to every single possibility of individualization ever, people will start changing stuff pretty rapidly at not regular intervals. And then you just start getting all these confounding variables, um, you know, on top of all the other things that we can't control in training anyway, that just make it nearly impossible to actually move forward in terms of individualization in the first place. And so an example I often like to talk about, and it's, it kind of seems stupid at first, but the more you think about it, I, I really, it really holds true to me is like, you have, you have to have some assumptions. You're like it's impossible not to have some assumptions when you're configuring a training program, because if that wasn't the case, again, this is going to sound silly, but if you kind of reflect on it, it's really been powerful for me. Like, if you didn't have to make any assumptions, why are we why are we strength training in the first place to get bigger and stronger? Like, you could go out and wash the dishes and and, and gauge your response on that and see if that led to a greater increase in your one RM in muscle size than training would, and so. The point being there, like you have to make some assumptions on on things that you think are going to be beneficial and lead you lead the vast majority of people to positive results. And then from there, once you've set these constraints, then you can more effectively start tweaking things one at a time within the systematic framework instead of just throwing yourself to the wind and, and, and changing things all willy nilly with all these confounding variables. So I think, um, again, that might sound silly, but I think uh, the more I've kind of reflected on that kind of example just understanding that assumptions are completely necessary and unavoidable that the, the more you can become comfortable with uh, making a few of these assumptions and understanding that um, but then also trying to move forward with some of these variables that we think are a higher priority because we can because we're setting a, a, a confined window and we're going to assess and repeat that process over time hoping to make one or two small changes each cycle to try to get closer to that theoretical optimality but uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hamper on that too much. So we'll kick over to the next question, unless you got something else to add, Josh. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, I think that's. I, I just wanted to add an additional framing to that is like, if we're trying to minimize the changes cycle to cycle, right, or at least not make massive changes, so you have no idea what's 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 actually responsible for a different response. And if, if we frame it as, okay, some things are more important to individualize than others, and we're also not making massive changes cycle to cycle, or, you know, completely revolutionizing your training, you're never, like, you have to prioritize something, I guess, is another way I would frame it, right? So, like, that's another reason you have to set up constraints, because, okay, you know, we, we, we look at the end of cycle number one on this product, and squat went awesome, deadlift went awesome, but bench, you know, it was kind of flat, we're not satisfied. What are we going to change here? You can like 
man, you could come up with a laundry list of things and throw the kitchen sink at it and, you know, see if it works, but it, okay, let's say it does work. What, what worked, right? Like what, what part of that worked? I think that's uh, very important to keep in mind or worse. If it doesn't work now, you have no good training data to draw from. So like, don't get me wrong. When I'm working one-on-one with the client, the goal is always to progress, but inevitably you're never going to, you're, there's no perfect training cycle, right? There's, um, there, there's going to, it's inevitable that there's going to be times where progress isn't where you want to. Otherwise there would, there would be no such thing as coaching. Um, and okay, we did all we could, but, and, and, and we didn't see the progress we want in one lift or two lifts or maybe three lifts if, if it really wasn't a great training cycle, but at least we have good training data. And at least we have a system through which we can navigate through over time. Right. And I've talked about this before is sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll get in that. I'll, uh, start up with an athlete and the first training cycle, it goes awesome, right? PRs and all three lifts, sunshine and rainbows. It's great. Other times that first training cycle, it'll be kind of bumpy. Um, in, in those cases, sometimes second training cycle, we hit the nail on the head with the changes and we're in, and, and, you know, things are looking better. Other times it takes three, four, five training cycles. And then things finally start to click because we've diligently thought about you know, what's going on over time and, and what changes are we making? And we're just slowly honing in on what works over time. And I, I have multiple clients that are on my coaching roster where we're, we're, we're finally at a point where we think we have a really good training formula for them, but it took time and it took a lot of patience and it, and it was tough at times to be able to, Hey man, I know, um, you know, I know that training cycle didn't go, go well, but we're getting more training data and, and, Sure enough, things eventually, as you hone in over time, things eventually do turn around for the for the better. So, just kind of wanted to add that in there. Um, One more quick comment because I just thought yeah, about go for it. it. It's almost to me, it's like it's almost sometimes helpful to think about crossing off uh, things on the list that that don't seem to help, just as it is to like kind of identify things that do help sometimes. So, like when you are setting this uh, this constraint cycle or unit that you're trying to individualize from. Like you said, if you're diligent with the systematic process, you can kind of go down your list and, and start seeing, okay, let's change this variable. Does it result in a positive response? Um, and then you can say, yes, it did, or no, it didn't. But if, if you're kind of just throwing the kitchen sink at it and changing way too many things at one time, then we don't really know, like you said, what works or the other side of the coin, we don't know what doesn't work. So that the next time you run into you know that bump in the road, you know, if, if you have previous success with changing a certain training variable, maybe that's what you try again, um, that kind of thing. So I think sometimes it's also equally helpful to kind of know what doesn't work when you change it than it is to know what does work. So I think that's another benefit of constraining yeah. kind of the the, the, uh, the unit that we're looking to individualize from. For sure. And I think we're going to probably get into this a little bit when we talk about who this product is for. But just really quick, I just want to say, like, I think having a system that you're operating within is more important than optimizing that system. Now, don't get me wrong. We think our we're, we're going to do all we can to optimize our system, whether it's for one-on-one -on -one clients or for this this individualized programming product. But the fact that you have a system, I think, is more important than what exactly that system is. And we want to provide a system for more people because we think that is necessary, or I wouldn't say necessary, but is very very helpful, especially if you're you're not super satisfied with your rate of progress. So I think we can stop rambling on that unless you have anything or we <laughs> no, can, that's good. You want to, you want to kick off number three? Yeah. Minutes? Yeah. So I think, um, kind of the third point we've came around to that, that really fits in well with number two, but, um, we think it deserves, you know, a conversation around itself is just the concept of seeing a cycle through. So I think a lot of times when we're looking to, to individualize things, we can get feedback from an athlete or, or, or as a coach, maybe we're seeing some training data trend in a certain direction that makes us get cold feet and, and want to make um, some adjustments mid-training cycle um, in, in kind of reaction to whatever's going on uh, in the immediate. And the more we've kind of come around to this is, is that number one, pro progress is almost never predictable, right? Like obviously our goal is to get progress in a predictable spot by, you know, individualizing things over time as this whole discussion is this frame around. But if, if you think you're going to go to the um, you know, the casino and try to bet on people's rate of progress. I don't think you'd be coming out with a lot of money. So I think that's, that's something to keep in mind. Um, so when you're, when you're evaluating training, especially in the short term, 
I just don't think you can gain a lot of data um, that's useful. Just like we said from the, in the last point, if you're constantly changing things to these short-term reactions throughout the training cycle. So this concept we've kind of came around to is, okay, we're constraining the training unit that we're looking to individualize from. So when we make changes and we've kind of set this unit to how we want to run it for this training cycle, we need to see that cycle through. By, by doing so, we're going to maximize the quality of the training data we had. And this goes right back to all the, all the positive points we discussed in the, in the last uh, kind of bullet point here. Um, and, and that's in contrast to changing a bunch of things in the middle of the training cycle in which now we can't compare apples to apples with this cycle prior. So I don't know if this training cycle goes better. Was it because I, you know, changed something, um, you know, throughout it? Was it for, you know, a vast other, other amount of reasons? Um, so you can't really have any diagnostic clarity when you're looking to evaluate that training cycle if you're changing a ton of things and then we can no longer compare apples to apples. So that's kind of the overall concept there. But Josh, go ahead and give your thought. Yeah, like I said, these three things we've discussed, you know, the first being that um, the configuration of certain training variables is necessary to get progress off the ground. The second one being that some constraints are unavoidable. And finally, this third one that seeing the cycle through is necessary. I, I want to give the exact example where it really clicked for me in that seeing the cycle through, again, I learned this the hard way. Um, seeing the cycle through is necessary. So um, I have a, a client I've been working with for a while now. Um, we've done, I, I don't even know how many training cycles we've done together, but basically the the way um, I th this this really clicked for me is that um, I would I would never see much positive trend during like our our kind of building phases. So you know, during our, our strength phase and our hypertrophy phase and our strength phase. Um, so I was always hesitant to pull the, the trigger on a taper and a test with him. Um, but, you know, a, a couple times I was apparently convinced to do so. And whenever I would pull the trigger, he would hit PRs on every lift almost every time. So basically what I learned to expect over time by, by noticing this a couple times is that he just kind of needs a taper and a test to hit his PRs and he probably will. So now I know when I'm looking, you know, as he's completing a training cycle, when I'm looking through those, those first, you know, 10, 11 weeks, I, I'm not going to be disappointed anymore if things are relatively flat, because I know that once we get to that taper and test week, he reliably hits PRs, right? And we've built his total up a really good amount the last three training cycles, um, because we kind of just we we talked about it. We're like, yeah, this is just kind of the the pattern we're seeing. It's working well. If we can keep up this rate of progress, you're gonna be a really strong dude in a couple of years. Um, so that really clicked with me. In in that, if you don't, if I didn't see the training cycle through, including that taper and test week, I would have never, I would have never found that pattern for that individual. And it does seem that some individuals have different patterns, and and within an individual, there are. Um, different patterns for different lifts sometimes. So if you are in week four and you're like, man, my estimated one or M is staying the same, you have two issues there. First of all is if there are patterns and it's progress is going to emerge, you're never going to figure that out because you're, you're, you're jumping shit before you even um, have the opportunity to see the cycle through. And second of all, like Zach said, is if it's a bunch of individualized, if, it, if, if you're just worrying about individual data points, um, you know, you're gonna, you're just gonna get lost in the noise of the data. So that's why we've fallen on 12 week training cycles for this product. And we, we, we kind of view that uh, as a happy medium between on one hand, that's enough to get a really solid trend line of the data. So when we're um, analyzing train, uh, the data for you, um, it's going to project a trend line and it's going to kind of take the, the, the intercepts at, at week 12 and week one. And again, using your strength level as well as the rate of gains from the research in our, in our clients. Um, it's going to indicate, you know, again, using red, yellow, or green, your rate of progress. Um, because again, we care about the trend as opposed to individual data points. So again, 12 weeks, it, it allows you to get a good trend line where you have um, enough data points to actually create a good trend line. But it's also not too long to the point where, okay, over time, as we're making these small to moderate changes cycle to cycle, it's not taking 10 years to individualize your training. Now, don't get me wrong, Ind individualizing your training does take time, 
but you know, this is kind of the happy medium of that. Okay. So I think that's all I have to say. The, the, actually one more thing about seeing the cycle through is that we, we, we kind of view it as a positive that we've created a system that doesn't make day to day or week to week changes adaptively. Because again, if, okay, you had, um, you know, for whatever reason you had finals and we cut the, 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 the training stress in half, it becomes very, very hard to actually detect what's working for the individual, right? So if, if you're reactively adjusting the, the training stress or, re, uh, or um, you know, reactively adjusting the, the protocols, whatever, it becomes, again, very hard to see that um, formula for the individual to see whether the progress actually emerges or not, right? So I think that's all I have to say about number three. Zach, you have anything to add? All right, I'm going to add in bonus number four. Zach, I know we're going a bit longer than I thought, but um, we'll, 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 we'll wrap up here soon. So bonus number four that I actually thought of while we were chatting is that subjective input is very important. So yes, we're going to give you the, the tools for objective progress. Um, there's also some recovery stuff in there. We're going to give you the tools to look at things objectively, but sometimes blindly following the data is limited. So that's why in the post cycle quiz that uh, you'll take after each training cycle also incorporates some subjective feedback as well as allows you to integrate or kind of layer on top your subjective input in addition to the objective information you see um, on uh, your, your data analysis tab. So again, the numbers are helpful, but they're not perfect. So we wanted to say, okay, we don't trust an algorithm to make these calls 100% of the time. So how do, we, how do we rectify that? We give you the information, we give you the objective information, you layer on your subjective information and through the private Facebook group, through the monthly webinars, if you're interested in, in diving deeper and making sure you're, you're truly making the right calls, you can like kind of gain some education and, and some expertise in making those calls. Um, because again, just following the objective data is limited at times. So that's bonus number four is that subjective input matters too. 100%. Yeah, I think that's huge. Um, and at face value, we talk about this all the time and we kind of regret the name of our company a lot because it gives the impression that we're just totally driven by numbers, graphs, spreadsheets. And, and while some of that's true, obviously a big component of this individualized programming self coaching toolkit product is kind of that, that trend line and performance evaluation um, system that Josh mentioned. But we, we always like to mention that subjective uh, feedback is, is just as much data and evidence, uh, at just as much as objective uh, numbers and, and data are. So I think that's really important to stress um, in that, you know, not only is that going to help you further kind of evaluate the progress, but I think your subjective feedback is further going to inform where we go next. Um, you know, one, one person could have a, you know, a lack of, of progress or, you know, a, a very uh, rapid rate of progress, but depending on their subjective feedback, we might go in different directions for the next training cycle uh, based on that. And, and, and again, that just gives more context to the numbers that um, only kind of just inform us at baseline. And then the subjective uh, feedback layers on top of that to really give us a strong indication of where to go uh, in terms of adjustments for the next training cycle. So, yeah, I don't, I don't want to belabor the point too much, but yeah, I totally agree. And I think that cannot be overstated that we, we value that just as much as, as the objective uh, performance information. And that's going to help us um, individualize this process further. And as you said, the more uh, educated and, uh, uh, you know, kind of the more context the, the, the individuals gain in the Facebook group and the webinars, I think that just makes that feedback even more uh, helpful because they continue to kind of know what to look for and, and how, to, uh, how to give proper feedback to, to really uh, continue to individualize things over time. Awesome, man. Um, okay, so as promised, we wanted to quickly address kind of who this product is for and who it's not for. So let's be very upfront in saying who it's not for. So it's not for you if you have a coach or if you feel you have a good system for dialing in the factors that we kind of talked about are most important to individualize. Or if you've come to a different conclusion and you have a system for individualizing those, go for it. Because staying within a system for a while is necessary, right? So the, the way we've created this individualized programming product is that it gets better over time. 
the first training cycle, we're going to do our best to get a good starting point for you. But really where the magic happens and where you can build your total over time is when you're on cycle three, when you're on cycle four, five, six, when you're on cycle 10, because over time you're honing in on those training variables over time. And it, it, it's exactly how it goes when we're working with clients one-on-one. -on -one. If I get if I get a client and the first training cycle doesn't go so hot, we're probably going to make some some decently large scale changes. Again, we're not throwing the kitchen sink uh, at it, but you know we're going to kind of reapproach things. But when we're on cycle number five, cycle number six, things are going well, and they're going well reliably and repeatably. Sure, we might tweak things over time, but things are staying pretty constant because if we keep up this rate of progress, we've both decided that this is to this is you know, we're going to build your total and you're going to be a strong individual um, in, in in the coming years. So again, if you have a coach, stay with, stay with your coach. Like definitely, like I think working with somebody or working within a system for a while is, um, is necessary. And, you know, sticking with something is probably going to be your best bet over time. Um, yeah, Zach, anything to add there? Yeah, no, no, I think that was a pretty good summary. Again, I don't want to belabor the point too much, but having individual attention is probably always going to going to trump uh, having a kind of a more of a group based approach. So if you do have a coach, we think that's going to be probably uh, the, be the best place to stick. However, as we mentioned, the, the kind of the limitations of coaching inherently um, are going to leave a ton of lifters on serve, which is kind of what we've designed this product to be. And we'll kind of get into that that next who this progress, uh, who this product is for. Excuse me. Yeah, so so piggybacking right off that is is this is a lower cost option that we've just tried to make a really really good value. At the end of the day, one on one attention will trump a group based approach. But we said, okay, when you can't work one on one with an athlete, what are the downsides to that? And we said, okay, these are the downsides we're working with. How do we push those to the floor and minimize those downsides and make sure this is the best value dollar per dollar we could possibly make it? And that largely comes down to. Uh, the private Facebook group and the webinars. So again, we kind of created this system through this library of 500 different training cycles. And okay, we're going to help you dial in the most important training variables over time. But if you do want to adjust the nitty gritty, if you want, um, you know, to learn about how to psychologically approach top sets in your hypertrophy phase versus your strength phase, you know, I'm sure that's going to come up in the discussion in the Facebook group, as well as, you know, monthly webinars. That's actually something I have on my list that we're, we're, we'll probably cover at some point, um, you know, because those are things where you were working one on one with a coach that you can get coached up on. Um, and that's a downside of, of uh, kind of the, the more group based approach. But we're again, we're trying to minimize those downsides, push those downsides to the floor and ensure that um, you know more people can have access to the individualization process and more people can dial their training in over time because again it's about being in a system that that will help to improve your training over time i think that's the key is finding that system sticking within a system and allowing this the system to work so that you can get uh, you can build your total because at the end of the day you're probably not going to put 300 pounds on your total in a training cycle it's about accumulating a satisfactory rate of progress cycle over cycle so that five years from now you can take a step back and be like wow i i, I kind of had this slow climb up and now i'm at a total I'm, I'm you know i'm very satisfied with my progress so anything to add there zach not too much but yeah i just want to just kind of put a bow on this and, and just uh kind of talk about it a little bit more but um yeah i, I think this product is going to do a really really good job uh, for for both kinds of people we talked about a, if somebody just really wants solid programming, that's going to kind of show them the foundations of how to build a solid program and how to adjust that over time, you're covered. Don't have to think too much about it. You just want it. that solid training program. Again, you're going to be you're going to be covered. But if you're the type of person that is just getting into this and wants to kind of have all the benefits of coaching um, at, at a cost effective rate, I guess not all the benefits, but most of the benefits in terms of teaching you. You know, again, what is a, what is a solid foundational training program? What does that look like? And then, more importantly, how are we individualizing that over time? And then teaching you um, via the education and, and the discussion. You know, as this process goes on, you're understanding why we are making the changes we are, 
why we're asking the questions we are and just getting you to further build that tool set so that you can understand the individual prioritization process a little bit more, just as if you were working with a, with a coach. And hopefully that's going to allow you to not only take advantage of the individualization system a little bit better over time, but also just help you and understand the process more so that if you do decide to kind of dive into the nitty gritty details and tweak things a little bit more, you're coming from an educated perspective and you know how to make those changes, you know, little changes at a time, like we just discussed that allow you to get to a more uh, ideal point in the individualization process long term um, and just kind of you know reach the best of both worlds um, with a cost effective product so I think that's pretty much all I got man cool I that's all I have as well um, we're going to go ahead and link to further information about the individualized programming product in whether you're on YouTube in the bio there or in the description on whatever podcast player you're on and on that page um, you'll there'll be a list of frequently asked questions you can kind of look through if, if we didn't cover any question in this podcast. Um, and at the very bottom of the page, there's also a place where you can enter a question to reach out to us. So again, like we said, this isn't going to be for everybody. If you have a coach, stick with your coach. If you're in a good system, stick in your system. But we're trying to cast a wire net and, and we think this is going to be able to serve a lot more people. Um, but again, it's not going to be for everybody. If you're not sure it's for you or you want to make sure it's a good fit, go ahead and fill out that form and just uh, drop whatever question you have um, in the in that form at the bottom of the page. And we'll be honest with you if, if you don't think if we don't think it's a good fit. For example, we had somebody ask us, hey, I have a meet in six weeks. Do you think this is a good idea? We said, hey, probably not. Um, so if, if you're interested in that, kind of the cutoff is about, we'd say nine or 10 weeks out from a meet where you could realistically hop on this and be ready for the meet um somewhere in that nine to 12 weeks range um so yeah if you have any further questions just go ahead and drop that uh, at, at the link in the bio or the description and we appreciate you listening have a good one